Good morning, Good Shepherd. And happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. Would you please rest on your feet? God, we thank you for this day, this special day. We thank you, Lord, for all of the mothers who are gathered in this space and mothers who are worshiping with us from afar. We ask your blessings upon mothers worldwide, for we love our mothers and we thank you. God bless us as we come together now to mingle our voices, our minds, and our spirits so much so that we will worship you in spirit and in truth. This I pray in the strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I must, under constraints of conscience and otherwise, uh, always remind us that we are still uh, being uh, attacked by an invisible enemy and we want to be vigilant as we move forward. Things are changing all around us and we are trying to change as cautiously as we can along with those things, but we ask us to be cautious going forward. I noticed the arrangement is a bit different this morning. I thank God for Sister Nichols who's up there. She's usually down here. We thank God for her and her recovery and for Dr. Weldon Hill, who's, uh, as always, uh, doing what Weldon Hill does. And we thank God for all of you who are in this space. Deacon Leroy Diggs uh, has been discharged from the hospital to a rehab center. He asked that I convey his sincere thanks for all of the prayers that have gone up, all the concerns on his behalf. He remains faithful as God's got him, and he's going to be all right. He uh, wants us to know that we can visit but do it sparingly because he's trying to get his strength back. So uh, please be mindful of that. Reverend Lawrence C. Smith underwent sinus surgery uh, last week and she is doing well. She's at home and we thank God for that. Um, Deacon Helen Finner had death in her family recently again and we are praying with Deacon, Deaconess uh, Finner for we know that, and she knows as well, that God walks with us through these very difficult times. Donations to the Woodville children for their moving on ceremony in June are still needed. They need white bottom, uh, white, I'm sorry, white button-up shirts and ties for boys and dresses for girls. A few dresses have been donated from our clothes closet, and you may also make donations if shopping is not your thing. Uh, so please uh, let us help these young people as they move on from uh, their point now to going to higher education. A family carnival is uh, scheduled here for next Saturday, this Saturday coming from 11 to 3. I understand there will be moon bounce here and music and activities and food. So please come out and share as we have our annual family carnival on Saturday from 11 to 3. <sighs> Ladies want to know whether or not the fish fry is just for the men. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. I'm told that there'll be enough fish that'll feed everybody who want to come. All right? All right. The men are trying to get, the intent is to get men involved again. Uh, the sisters have been meeting and doing things, and we want to, as much as we can get our men involved as well. And some of the men have come, have stepped up and we wanna make certain that we, uh, we are in the number. So men, uh, please come. Ladies, you're welcome. Amen. Um, we had not been reading the church's covenant for a number of years and we read it at the beginning of the year. I don't know if you did, but I forgot to read it the second Sunday in February. I forgot last month as well. It's May now. So I'm thinking that we probably might need to ease back in like reading it once a quarter and that way we get used to it because uh, we used to read it all the time, every second Sunday, but we kind of got away from that, but we want to ease our way back in. So 
if you don't mind, uh, bring your uh, church covenant, your copy, I know you got one, uh, next month. And we will read it then, and we will probably read it a couple of times before the year's end. All right? Amen. Now, somebody's going to come and you're not going to remind me because I don't remember things like I used to. You remind me after church. We were supposed to read the church covenant. Why didn't you say something? Well, <laughs> we, we want to be mindful of that. Um, it's good to have all of you here. It's good to have those persons who are on the phones, uh, conference call, and those who are worshiping with us um, by YouTube. I spoke to Mama this morning. Mama told me to tell all the mothers Happy Mother's Day. That's from Mama. Mama will be uh, 92 in August, and Mama's doing well. Uh, she's doing well. Mama is probably about that high. But Mama has always lived in such a way that she said, I don't care how tall y'all get. You have to look up to me. Amen. And I thank God for life lived that way for we have a great mark to reach when we talk about our mothers and what they have meant to us, what they still mean to us. And we thank God. For the quiet this morning that uh, melodiously led us into the presence of God under the direction of Dr. W. Weldon Hill, where our sister Brenda Nichols sit in the choir herself and accompanied by our brother Jonathan Cobb. We are thankful for these ladies who adorn our walls quietly serving. We thank God for them. And for the ladies upstairs, Teresa and Pat, we are thankful to God for them. Al is downstairs waiting on y'all to bring all that money so he can help count it. Amen. And we thank God for Tommy who's around somewhere and we thank God for Kevin as well. We praise God for all that God has allowed us to do in these very difficult times. We are thankful that uh, he's still blessing us. Um, for those of you who are behind perhaps Sister Daly right there and um, Brother and Sister Thaxon over there, uh, you can, when you look behind, you don't see too much. But those of us up here, we see two screens up there. I don't know if you can see them or not. There are two screens up there with the text that I'll read in a few minutes. If you can look over here and see that blue tape down there, if you look up, you see like a brown piece of tape and another brown piece of tape. That's where the big screen is going to be. And it'll be one like that on this side. And I see Jay up there. Jay, God bless you. I see him up there. That's our engineer. I mentioned to you last week some people were concerned about uh, they thought we were asking somebody to, to help put the screens up, that's what he does. Yeah, we, we already got that covered, he, he does that. And as soon as things are in, equipment and all that, it'll be up and running. We want persons who know how to operate and I'm certain he'll be in a position to show us how to do that as well. So we thank God for your gifts. Please don't be like uh, some person when you're building, you know, adding on to the building, you don't want to give for one, one reason or another. I know that's not you, but I mean people who act like that. As soon as the building get up, look at what we did. No, you ain't do nothing. You sat back while it was being done. And I know you're not doing that because all the time there are gifts given to the audiovisual ministry and we thank God. It's been a minute coming, but God uh, does things in God's own time. And we thank God for that. From 1 Samuel, Chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, my endeavor will be to read through verse 18. First Samuel, chapter 1, reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. This is the word of the Lord. There was a certain man of Ramathang, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, 
Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up every year by year from his own town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions of his to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child. Then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went her way and ate and drank with her husband. And her countenance was sad no longer. Verses 1 through 18, 1 Samuel chapter 1. The word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of God.
There are a number of things I need to do after the message, so don't let me forget like I just did. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child. Then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicant, and no razor shall touch his head. For a few moments, what's a mother to do? Let us pray. God, thank you for the preaching moment. Thank you for the mothers who are uppermost in our minds on this day especially. But Lord, I'm not able. Come now in all your quickening power of the Holy Spirit and preach, Lord, this your gospel with power and with conviction. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is a great day. The modern holiday of Mother's Day was first celebrated in 1908 when Anna Jarvis held a memorial for her mother in Grafton, West Virginia. She then began a campaign to make Mother's Day a recognized holiday in these yet-to-be United States. Although she was successful in 1914, she was already disappointed with the commercialization by 1920s. Jarvis's holiday was adopted by other countries, and it is now celebrated all over the world. In this tradition, each person offers a gift, a card, a remembrance to their mother, grandmother, and our maternal figure on Mother's Day. To be sure, today is a very special day for millions around the world because we still have our mothers with us. I hasten to say, however, that Sadness is a constant companion for many today because their mothers have been called from labor to reward. I spoke to a 40-something uh, young lady some time ago who began to shed tears when she spoke about her mother who had passed away over 20 years ago. You never forget a mother's tender love and care. I think that it is helpful at this point to mention the reality that not only uh, in some people's mind, when you talk about mothers, it's just those who have given birth, but uh, not all women are mothers. But most, if not all women, have motherly instincts. We have natural mothers, surrogate mothers, spiritual mothers, adopted mothers, and women who fit in several other categories, including, I was hearing somebody saying, pet mothers. Mm-hmm, you own a dog or cat, you're a pet mother. Somebody say, I ain't got chick nor child, but you got a cat, so you're a mother. No, my sister, you don't, you didn't give birth to a child, 
but you have those God-given qualities to make you a mother. How am I able to make such a statement, you say? Well, let me see if I can press my point. If sister, you care deeply for children, even those little crumb crushes you just met. And sister, you keep the faith and exhibit steadfastness in the word of God. Sister, you have a keen sense of discernment and you bring order right in the midst of chaos. Sounds like a mother to me. Sister, you cultivate a welcoming and joyful environment. Sister, you demonstrate unconditional love and you forgive the offenses of others willingly. Sister, you embrace a spirit of contentment and you persist in prayer at all times. Sounds like a mother to me. Sister, you are super patient and flexible. Sister, you are understanding and fearless. Sister, you are sympathetic and empathetic and you insist on holding to what is right. Sister, you are compassionate and selfless and you always put others before yourself. Now that shown sure up sound like a mother to me. I want to talk for a little while this morning about a sister who, when we first meet her, is not a mother, but she desperately wanted to be a mother. I want to talk about a sister who reminds us that being a mother is a sacred partnership that brings uh, joy to women as they share with God in this process. I'm sure that on more than a few occasions, Anna, Hannah in this text asks herself, what's a want-to-be mother to do? Therefore, I want to talk for a few minutes about a sister who was barren, a sister who was broken, but a sister who ultimately was blessed. Pray with me for just a few minutes. When we meet Hannah in the text, she is barren. She had been unable to conceive children. And in the Old Testament times, a childless woman was considered a failure. In a male-centered society, where the focus was on producing an heir to continue the family's name, to be barren was to fail the family. Barrenness was also considered to be a punishment from God. Consider also that Hannah's barrenness was a social embarrassment for her, her husband. Children were a very important part of the society's economic structure. They were a source of labor for the family, and it was their duty to care for their parents in their old age. Let me stick a pen right there. Somebody ought to hear that, because as soon as mom and them can't do for mom and themselves, some of us, not in this room, but some of us ship them off to a home somewhere where we never see them again. Just putting that out there. If a wife could not bear children, she often oblig she was obligated by the rules back in that day. Don't try it today, brothers. But she was obligated to hire a servant girl for her husband to bear a child for her. The husband was permitted to divorce a barren wife, and Elkanah could have done just that and left Hannah. But he remained lovingly devoted to her in spite of the social criticism and his rights under the law. Sound like Joseph when he could have divorced Mary because she popped up pregnant. He ain't know nothing about it. Just putting that in there. Hannah's story reminds us that the world is full of people who feel inadequate and incomplete for one reason or another. Too often we find ourselves measuring our worth based on what others have that we don't have, or what others can do that we can't do. Many times we will go to exorbitant and sometimes destructive lengths trying to keep up with the whoever's. The truth of the matter is that we can't do any more than God blesses us to do, and we won't have any more than God blesses us to have. Hannah seemed to be stuck in verse 7 of our text. 
The new King James Version puts it this way. So it was year by year when she went to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she did not eat. Hannah was not only barren, she was also broken. Hannah's brokenness was due to her adversary, Penina, who would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children, or so they thought. The Bible says that year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and wouldn't even eat. The sister was broken. You see, one of the worst aspects of Hannah's plight was that she tended to feel the worst when she went to church. While we normally think of the comforts of taking our troubles to the house of the Lord, it was when the family made that annual pilgrimage to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to God, that Hannah would feel the worst. Shiloh was an important worship center some 15 miles from their home. It wasn't the only place of worship, but it was an important place, probably because the Ark of the Covenant was there. And the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of Almighty God. The ritual they observed was the practice of giving a portion of meat to each member in the family. And to sit and watch each of Panina's sons and daughters receive a portion was a painful reminder to Hannah that she had no children. It's easy to see how Hannah must have dreaded everything associated with going and getting ready for that annual trip to Shiloh. While everyone else was eating and drinking and enjoying the time of fellowship, she was having her sense of failure magnified all over again. There are people today for whom worship is not a time of forgiveness and renewal. Too often it is a time of heightened guilt. And many of us who proclaim, not in this room, the gospel of Jesus Christ don't help with some of our outlandish and unbiblical things that we say talking about we are the children of God. Only God knows how many people come to worship, as Hannah did, and have their pain increased over past failures, unfulfilled dreams, and deep senses of inadequacy. They walk in, you know how we do. They walk in and eyes start rolling and mumbling start carrying on. And there are people who come every Sunday. Now, from the text, it appears that Elkanah married Hannah for love, but he married Panina for children. The more he tried to show his love for Hannah, the more Panina tormented her. Most likely, Panina's accusation would have sounded something like this. Girl, you barren because God is punishing you for the sin you have committed. Look, I can have children and you can't. Mm. Hannah heard the taunt so often that like an abused child, she came to feel that maybe she did deserve it. Her husband showed a certain insensitivity with his blunt statement and insensitive question. Why are you crying, Hannah? Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you can't have children? You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? Her answer was to go to the temple in bitterness of soul, where she prayed and wept in anguish. Hannah was broken. Hannah was barren. But I stopped through here this morning to tell you that Hannah was also blessed because she knew that when she had a problem or concern, she could take it to the Lord in prayer. Today, a barren sister might visit her gynecologist 
or a fertility clinic. But how does they lack our scientific knowledge of the reproductive system? She felt that God had closed her womb, so the most natural thing for her to do was to ask God for help. The nature of her vow was clear. If God would do something for her, she would do something for God. On the surface of it, the idea of making a deal with God seems a bit offensive, but it is one of our basic instincts. Even today, there's something in us that makes us believe that we can negotiate with God. You know, when you were <laughs> in that fix, Lord, if you just get me out of this one. I ain't the only one said that. <laughs> if, if you do it, God, I'll so and so and so. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Hannah had good reason to feel discouraged and bitter. She was unable to have children. She shared her husband with a woman who ridiculed her. Yeah, her loving husband could not solve the problem. And even the high priest misunderstood her motives. But instead of retaliating or giving up hope, Hannah prayed. She brought her problem, her burden, her barrenness, her all of that, she brought it honestly before God. The text suggests that Hannah didn't speak words that could be heard, but that her lips moved as she spoke the words in her heart. This may be the clue to the success of her prayer. The indication in the Bible is that God hears those who cry to him in their distress. The book of Exodus tells us that the Israelites cried out to God in their slavery and God heard their groaning. Israelites crying out to God in their slavery, God heard it. It is a breakthrough in our relationship with God when we recognize that God can handle our anger and our frustration. I know you're mad with God, don't want to admit it, but be mad with God. God can handle your anger. This brings new dimension of honesty to prayer and worship and fellowship with God. The priest Eli was mistaken in his first impression of Hannah. He thought she was drunk, but when he realized that she was not drunk, he was moved by her seriousness and convinced by her explanation. He pronounced God's blessing upon her by saying, go in peace. The God of Israel grants your petition which you have asked of him. These were the words that changed Hannah's life. There's a sense in which after Eli spoke to Hannah, nothing had changed. And yet, Everything had changed. Her past misery had taken her appetite, but the Bible says that now she wanted to eat. The woman who only moments before had described herself to Eli as a woman of a sorrowful spirit is now described with the phrase, her face was no longer sad. The words of Eli created in her hope that affected how she looked and how she felt. Each of us may face times of barrenness when nothing's come to birth in our work or in our service, in our relationships. It's difficult to pray in faith when we feel so ineffective. But as Hannah discovered, prayer opened the way for God to work. God heard and wonderfully answered Hannah's prayer. A son was born to her. She called him Samuel because she said he was a gift from the Lord. True to her word, Hannah took Samuel when he was probably around six years old to Eli the priest and dedicated him to full-time service in the house of the Lord. Hannah was willing to sacrifice herself for the sake of her son. She loved him so much that she was willing to forego a mother's greatest joy that of bringing up her son and having him around her. She was committed to doing whatever it took to reach its godly potential. Notice, if you will, that the greatness of Samuel reflects 
in the greatness of his mother, Hannah. Consider this, if you will. Samuel led Israel in his first great revival. That's Hannah's boy. Samuel drove the Philistines back in their own territory. That, that's Hannah's boy. Samuel reestablished true worship of God. That's, that's Hannah's boy. Samuel set up the kingdom of Israel. Samuel was the last of the Hebrew judges and the first of the major prophets. Samuel was the Israelites' first prophet, priest, and king, all rep in one. That's Hannah's boy. Samuel anointed Israel's first king, Saul. And Samuel anointed Israel's greatest king, David. God gave Hannah, and Hannah gave back to God. God wants you and me to possess the kind of love that keeps on giving. Despite our barrenness, our brokenness, God wants us to recognize the fact that we have been, we are now, we shall continue to be blessed by the best. Like Panina of our text. Too often we think that we are the captains of our ships and the conductors of our train, when in fact it is God who does all of that. God just keeps on blessing us over and over again. Now when mm, in your barrenness, in your brokenness, remember you are blessed. Mothers, if by chance you cry out in distress and anguish, what's a mother to do? Let me suggest with the songwriter that you take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. If the world from you withhold its silver and gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how he feeds the little birds. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. If your body suffers pain and you health you can't regain, and your soul is almost sinking in despair, Jesus knows the pain you feel. He cares and he saves and he will heal. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. When your enemies are assailed and your heart begins to fail, don't forget that God in heaven answers prayer. He will make a way for you and lead you safely through. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. When your youthful days hey, are gone and old age is sleeling on, and your body bends beneath the weight of care. He will never leave you. Then he'll lead you to the end. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Is there a mama in the house? who knows that you take your burden to the Lord, and the Lord will, the Lord will, the Lord will make a way. Yes, he will. What's a mother to do? Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. I thought about, Connie, when I was writing the conclusion, to name all the stuff mamas do. Wearing that same old raggedy dress so them children could get something put on their back. Sacrificing meal after meal, trying to put a little water with a little flour, make a little flapjack for the children. When the mama giving up her rights for them children wrong, that's what mamas do. Mama's been doing it for centuries, and mamas keep on doing it. Yeah, young men, if there are any listening, they say that mamas raise their daughters and love their sons. I don't know about that. Uh, I got a lot of, yeah, back in the day. I remember my last whipping. It might have been love in there somewhere, but I remember my last whipping. There ain't nobody like mothers. Somebody sagaciously said, although it's theologically incorrect, that God couldn't be everywhere, so he 
made mothers. And we thank God for being everywhere with our mothers. And we, you and I, many in this audience, stand on the shoulders of great mothers, mothers we shall never forget. Now I know somebody saying this, that, and the other about a certain mama. I know there's always uh, somebody. But God blessed us <coughs> with mothers. And I thank God. And I don't know, nobody I know was a test tube baby. All y'all come from mamas. All us. And nobody pop you out for a test tube. And however your upbringing was, thank mama. Thank mama. What's mother to do? Amen. Take your burden to the Lord Amen. and leave it there. Let us pray. God, thank you for Hannah of days gone by and Hannah's right now. We thank you for mothers everywhere. We thank you, Lord, that we are in great measure the persons we are because of our mothers. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with our mothers. Thank you for what they have poured into our lives. And thank you for what, for what they have shown us that we should pour into our offspring lives. Bless us, Lord, with the understanding that God loved us so much that he sent his only God begotten son. But then he also loved us so much that he gave us our mothers, and we thank you. Thank you, Master, for it is in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. There might be somebody here whose desire it is to give the Lord your life. You might want to join us as we try to make sense of our faith. And if you're here, we bid you, as the choir sings, that we bid you come in the name of Jesus. Won't you stand? If you are here, come in his name.
first time I heard that song. I had to find out who was singing it. <laughs> Deborah Snipes. Yes. Yeah. And Hannah, you sound just like her. Yeah. Lord have mercy. You sound better. You sound better. It's a squalling sister. Lord. Amen. Amen. <sighs> mm, mm, right. mm. Let me uh, do this because I'm going to uh, give our closing from down there. I forgot to uh, read some thank you notes and I want to I want to do that now. Some people give because they think they have to. For them, it's just the proper thing to do. But when you give, I always know it comes right from your heart. I'm thankful for your thoughtfulness and you. To my Good Shepherd family, thank you for all of your support and prayers. Only God, the power of prayer and love will see me through. Through this time, and I have all three. If he can see me to it, he can see me through it. Once again, thank you, and I love you all back. This comes from Sean Parham, a young man who, he is here today? Right in the back. In the back. Oh, okay, in the back, all right. Amen. I talked to Sean a few days ago, and he was talking strong about how he knew the Lord is going to bring him through, and he's here. And we thank God, we thank God. You have a caring heart and a generous spirit. And I'm so grateful that my life has been touched by both. Pastor Smith and Good Shepherd Baptist Church family, thank you for the cards, the calls, and all acts of kindness. But most of all, thank you for all of the prayers. You are greatly appreciated. God bless each of you. This comes from Brother James C. Garrett, Sr. Amen. Deacon Garrett's husband, who underwent surgery recently and is at home recovering. With thanks to all of you, sending all of you a sincere thank you for being so warm and wonderful. Thank you from the family of Mrs. Carol, Virginia Lee. The, this comes from the aunt of Sister Bessie Jean Brooks, and we are thankful. I saw my sister in the back, I think, and she sent a card. To Pastor Smith and my Good Shepherd family, I am doing well because my God showers down his healing power to me each day. Thank everyone for all you have done for me, especially your prayers. Because of you, there's someone who's thanking God today, someone who appreciates your warm and caring weight, someone who's remembering the special things you do and wishing you his blessings every day, the whole year through. From Reverend Ellen Bynum Johnson. Don't know if I saw Gregory, he might be celebrating. Now, Gregory Carter is 66. He used to sit right over there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting used to our uh, COVID seats. Thanking God for 60 years of marital bliss. This comes from, on May 11th, from Freddie and Esther Evans. <laughs> and not to be outdone, Celebrating 60 years of love and sacrifice, Freddie and Esther, there are no greater parents a daughter could have. May God continue to bless you. This comes from Deacon Lisa. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Some people, I think I read that one already. Yes, I did. That's the bottom of it. I wanted to do that because I was so anxious getting up here early, I forgot all of that. But uh, <laughs> we thank God that... Uh, the memory comes back every now and then. Uh, Mama Wembley, will you come up here? Come on. Somebody give her a tissue. On behalf of Good Shepherd Baptist Church and God Almighty, we present this to you on this Mother's Day as our honorary mother of our church. Amen. 
We are so proud of our honorary mother. Yes. God bless you. You, you, you want to say something? No, God is just so good to me. And I thank God for my church family. Y'all have just shown me so much love. And I can't express the way I feel because God, he just keeps blessing me over and over and over again. And thank you, thank you all. I think we should get our flowers while we're living and little bags with something in it. Let us prepare our hearts now as we come to the communion table. We do this differently than it was done in the first century, but the meaning is still the same. I want to draw our attention to Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And let me ask while we prepare ourselves, does everyone have a communion cup? You should have gotten one coming in, but if you didn't. Oh, bless your heart, deacon. And as I was being checked in downstairs, I think Deacon Hunt was giving these out herself. <laughs> I'm in good company. Amen. <laughs> she, she got that red, white, and blue card the other day, and I tell you. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, we find these words. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We thank God for the Lord instituting the, what we call the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the Eucharist. It reminds us of the great price that Jesus paid that we might have salvation at no cost, and we are thankful. It was on that occasion that he took the elements symbolic of his soon-to-be battered and bruised body and his shed blood, and he did what was so... Uh, characteristic of Jesus, and that is he prayed before he died, even as we shall do now. Lord, thank you for the elements that we shall partake of now that represent your broken and bruised body and your shed blood. Bless us, Lord, as we partake of these elements to be re reminded that you paid a great price so that we could have salvation at no cost. Bless these elements and bless all of us, for we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On that occasion, Jesus took bread, and he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Eat ye all of it. Let us do likewise. Afterwards, he took the cup, and he said to them, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, and invited them to drink from that cup. Let us do likewise. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we partake of the Lord's broken body and his shed blood, we do show forth his death and his suffering till he comes again. Won't you please, if you're able to, rest on your feet as we repeat the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples? Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven,
Amen. Thanks. Thank God again for these ladies in the choir under the direction of Dr. W. Weldon Hill, accompanied by Jonathan Cobb. We thank God for all of our ushers who are serving today. God bless you. For Pat, Trees upstairs, God bless you for your ministry as well. For Al downstairs, we thank God for him. And for our building manager, Tommy, we thank God for him. I see you, Brother Wright. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. We are thankful. Did I see Brother Tiller back there again today? No? I didn't? Okay. God bless all of you for just being you. Think about that sometime. Can you thank God for just being you? Not anybody else. Just being you. Because ain't nobody like you. I don't care if you got a twin, ain't nobody like you. And we thank God for his providential care of all of us. Let us look to him now as we move from this space, but never out of the care of God. God, thank you for your peace, your presence, your power, your prosperity in our lives. Thank you for blessing us in so many, many ways. And we thank you, Lord, over and over again for our mothers. Thank you for what they meant, mean, and always will mean to us. Lord, thank you for blessing us. and Help us to be a blessing, even as we have been blessed. Go with us now in whatever direction we're going, and lead, guide, and direct us by your Holy Spirit. And we'll be careful, Lord, as always, to give your name glory, honor, and praise. For we pray now in the merciful, magnificent, mighty, and majestic name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.